It's been nine months since Puerto Rico was hit by Hurricane Maria, the worst in its history. The American territory is still suffering power cuts and thousands of families were displaced. Recent studies suggest more than 4,600 people died as a result of the storm and its aftermath, dwarfing official estimates which were as low as just 64. What can be learned from the response and how many more lives could have been saved? This is Roundtable with me, Shuli Ghosh. Hurricane Maria was the strongest cyclone event recorded in the Atlantic in over 60 years. But the response to the damage caused has been criticised. And new evidence shows the pace at which hurricanes move across the planet is slowing, which has an even greater impact. So how can we be better prepared for what's coming our way? Hurricane Maria, the worst hurricane in Puerto Rico's history, affecting the Caribbean island's 3.4 million citizens. Official figures say the storm killed around 60 people, but nine months on, studies show it's more likely to be in the thousands, and the aid response is being investigated. How many lives could have been saved if the response was quicker and better? And why is the island still struggling to recover? September 20th, 2017, when Puerto Rico was battered by winds of around 123 miles per hour over a period of 12 hours. In more than 60 years of record, Hurricane Maria is the strongest cyclone event in the Atlantic. It not only took out homes, but it also destroyed the island's communication system, wiped out 80% of the crops and damaged 93% of the roads, making access for aid extremely difficult. Es una crisis en todo el país. No sé si usted ha recorrido el resto del país, eh, pero esto es una cosa increíble, increíble, increíble. Sí es una crisis a nivel de todo el país. The official death toll stands at 64. But studies suggest Hurricane Maria is responsible for 70 times that, with more than 4,600 dead, a figure that authorities are now being investigated over. Nine months on and the devastation to the island is still clear. Overall, Hurricane Maria caused losses of $90 billion. Repeated power cuts, including an island-wide one in April, leave citizens in constant darkness, affecting hospitals, which in turn interrupts medical care and is the cause of more deaths. More than 2,000 families are said to be still displaced and living in streets or hotels. One of my nieces was infected, no assistance medical. No había medicamentos para él. Cogió una bacteria por estar en el río. Eh, el río era la única solución para todos. Para lavar ropa, para bañarse, para todo. Despite being an American territory, the U.S. has been accused of not doing enough to help the plight of millions. The focus is now on how many of those deaths could have been prevented. Although the true number of those killed as a result of the storm may never be known, what lessons can be learned from the country's most tragic natural disaster? And with global warming increasing the likelihood of hurricanes in Puerto Rico, how can it be better be helped to be more resilient to natural disasters? Well, joining us from Washington, D.C. is Arelis Hernandez, a reporter for The Washington Post who spent two months in Puerto Rico covering the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. From San Juan in Puerto Rico is photographer Erica Rodriguez. And with me at the table is Carmen Solana, who teaches crisis and disaster management at the University of Portsmouth, and journalist Javier Fahe, who also covered the disaster in Puerto Rico. Uh, good to have all of you with us. And that report there gave us a real sense of the kind of damage on the ground. Um, Erica, let's start with you, because you, uh, you were there, you're still there. Uh, you documented many stories on the ground. What struck you most about the aftermath? I think it was a complete collapse of everything, of power, the mostly complete collapse of communications and how everything just like stopped working. There was no distribution of gas. There was no ATM working, no bank open. It was really hard to really understand the damage of the storm. 
because of the communications had collapsed, you really didn't know what was the effect around the island. I think it took a few days to really understand the damage, the disaster. And yet the official death toll was ridiculously low. It was, it, the original estimate was, was 64. Why, why was that? Were officials not properly categorizing the deaths or was there a deliberate attempt to, to downplay the death toll? I think the thing, the thing about it is that the government only counts as um, death of the hurricane, just direct death, meaning people that die during the storm or in the recent aftermath, um, meaning because of a landslide, because of flooding, because if someone was cutting a tree that had fallen and they got hit in the head and they died, that's counted as a direct death. But all of the indirect deaths are not counted in that toll. So all the people that died in the hospitals when the power collapsed, in people who were in IC in an intensive care unit that died, those people are not counted because they're counted as natural death. Erica, as they, were, as they, as they died from the diseases they have. Uh, Arellis, let me come to you. Do, do you agree with that? A lot of the deaths, uh, particularly in the aftermath, there were a lot of deaths because uh, medical care was interrupted, because the, 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 the power was lost, because people caught infections later on. Um, so th this original death toll, clearly, uh, the, the, the real numbers, the Harvard estimate puts it at uh, well over 4,600. Right. No, that one of the things we need to keep in mind about the Harvard study is that they, they, the median point was about 4,000, uh, but we're looking at a range of anywhere from about 800 to more than 8,500 people that may have died indirectly as a result of the storm. Now, the government's estimate um, is the deaths that they've certified, right, that they know were the result of the hurricane, as Erica uh, just pointed out. These interruptions, though, in medical services, uh, led to a gross undercount of the number of people who uh, who died in hospitals. I mean, Puerto Rico has about 64 hospitals, and I would say the majority of them, from what I can remember, and Erica can correct me if I'm wrong, were not in full operation um, for most, I mean, for three, four months. And so during that time, there were a lot of folks who just didn't get the attention that they needed to be able to survive uh, their particular either chronic diseases or, you know, injuries they suffered as a result of the hurricane. Uh, the big question, of course, is is whether many of these deaths were preventable. Uh, Javier, would you say that with, with better planning, a better response, many of these deaths could have been avoided? Yes, I've been to Puerto Rico uh, and I can tr tell you that Puerto Rico was not prepared for this problem. Uh, 2017 was a very bad year for Puerto Rico. They, they, they were declared bankrupt early in the year with a debt of $33 billion, which means that Puerto Rico didn't have the financial resources to prepare themselves for this hurricane. And the, at the same time, um, the, you know, in Puerto Rico, the, the infrastructure is not suitable for this. Unlike other Caribbean states which know that this is going to happen, in Puerto Rico there was no any kind of preparation. And this has been going on for, for years. <clears throat> we mustn't forget that the intensity and frequency of hurricanes in the, in the North Atlantic has intensified since the 1980s, which means so that they knew... why wasn't there any preparation, uh, if they knew what was coming? Because, first of all, Puerto Rico has been neglected by the U.S. for many, many years. It's not a, a state of the nation. They have a, they have lived in a state in a limbo. The state is a free associated state, which means very little. Like they, they, they get they are heavily subsidized by the government, but they are reluctant to give them money. They don't have the resources, the infrastructure to be able to prepare themselves for these kind of situations. And this is not only with Trump. It's happened throughout the history of Puerto Rico. Uh, so that means that and if you put all this together and the fact that they didn't have enough money to prepare Puerto Rico because they were declared bankrupt, they therefore didn't have a penny, uh, you know, in the name, that made the situation. It was, no pun intended, the perfect storm to create this situation and that's what we see now. And the fact that there's a discrepancy between the official number of deaths and the number of deaths that has been reported later by studies shows very much how much there's a little interest in the situation in Puerto Rico to such an extent that they don't really investigate how many people actually died in the island. That's a terrible uh, situation for Puerto Rico at the moment. Carmen, do you agree with that? Does uh, socioeconomic status 
uh, does that affect the kind of response uh, a nation can expect in the aftermath of a disaster like Hurricane Maria? Absolutely. Of course, if you have the resources and if you have the uh, education to the population, if you do drills, if you, if, if you put part of your investment more in preparedness than in response, then of course the, the consequences are much so, so was it the case that Puerto Rico didn't know what was coming, or they did know, but they didn't have the resources to put in place a, a proper plan? Puerto Rico had about five days of warning. I, well, first of all, Puerto Rico knows that there is a hurricane season, and all the Caribbean is vulnerable to hurricanes right. in the hurricane season. So uh, if you're affected by a hurricane, how intense they are, how fast the winds are going to be is something that nobody can tell you until very close to the time. But they were in the hurricane season and they had actually, they knew that they were going to be hit by a high a category hurricane forecasted five days before. They saw what happened to Dominica. Dominica didn't have very much warning. Dominica only had about 24 hour warning from a category one or two to an incredibly fast intensification of Hurricane Maria into a Hurricane Five, full five, to hit the island of Dominica. They would have seen what happened, the devastation that occurred in Dominica. And the, it, there was a forecast that saying that the, the consequences, the, that Puerto Rico was going to be hit and the consequences were going to be very important. But there was no, um, no preparedness, no bringing some resources and, and having some uh, help ready in case for the aftermath of this uh, disaster. And also I understand that there wasn't very much preparation. Not everybody boarded, the, boarded their houses. Not everybody um, went to shelters. They, so what, because they didn't know it was going to be that bad? Well, I think, I think there might be a, a compound of uh, reasons in here. One of them is okay. uh, because of they tend to think, oh, it's not going to be that bad, it's going well, to slow down. Let's ask Erica, because uh, I mean, you, so you're there. Uh, presumably people in Puerto Rico know that there's a storm on the way. Mm. They've seen other devastating storms in the region. Did people get warning that it was going to be as bad as it was? I think people did get warnings, but nobody expected it to be this bad. We, nobody in my generation or my mother's generation had experienced a storm this strong. This uh, idea that um, there was less interest in recovery efforts in, in Puerto Rico because um, it perhaps uh, is not recognized as an American territory or, or, or the people in Puerto Rico aren't treated as much as US citizens as perhaps if they had been on the mainland, uh, the point that Javier was making. Do you agree that that was, it had a part to play in how quickly the US government responded to the, uh, to the disaster of Hur Hurricane Maria? Well, I'm going to respond to that in, t in two parts, right? So let's keep in mind also the context of this. Um, I covered three hurricanes, uh, two hurricanes before this particular hurricane. We had Hurricane Harvey, which utterly devastated Houston. We had Hurricane Irma, which swiped the, the peninsula in Florida. Uh, and then you had Maria a few days later come in and just obliterate Puerto Rico and a lot of the islands in the Caribbean. And so to some degree, you had a federal government that had some level of hurricane fatigue, right? Like, you know, you, you had resources that were flowing into those two major, huge areas, population centers. Um, and what you could hear from federal officials was, you know, they were running low on, on materials. There were shortages of materials in Puerto Rico when it came to the power restoration, for example. There weren't enough poles. There weren't enough transformers to be able to install. Now, this, towards the second part of your question about Puerto Rico's political status, it, it is a complicated story. I mean, Puerto Rico has been a, essentially a colony of the United States uh, for more than 119 years. That's right. And so that has brought with it a, a level of complication and a, a difficult relationship uh, between the two. And well, apparently, that, according to a, a recent poll, Arellis, a, a recent poll showed that more than half of Americans don't realize that Puerto Rico is a U.S. territory and that its residents are U.S. citizens. 
Yeah, I actually think that poll was taken right before the hurricane. And that's absolutely true. Most people didn't know that, you know, Erica and I are American citizens. I mean, I was born on the mainland, but that we're American citizens and we're part of this big country. Um, but I think that's changed now. At least I, I hope it's changed uh, to some degree that people understand, you know, with this devastation, with all the news that's come out about what's happened there. And people do on, on the island feel as though they are second class citizens. You ask anybody on the island and they'll tell you that they do feel abandoned. Yes. Uh, and and yes. you agree with that? Yes, yeah. that was there, as I told you. I, in fact, I interviewed Ricardo Rosselló, the current governor there. Basically, the word colonial status, he agreed with that. And that's why he is adamant that Puerto Rico should become the 50 first state of the union and the majority voted in a non-binding uh, referendum last year in favor of this status and, and i even spoke to people who favor independence who voted for statehood and i said but why do you do that I said, because we need to get rid of this limbo this status is very um, unstable. They are American citizens, but they cannot, the, the Puerto Ricans cannot vote for presidential elections, for example. They have one kind of commissioner represented in Congress. They don't have congressmen represented there. Uh, the legal status is very, in terms of legality, they have to deal with uh, courts in the US to deal with their own legal status. So they find it very frustrating that, and, and they cannot establish relations with other Caribbean states independently because of the so status. Do you so, think, because there have been calls for an independent commission into the number of deaths in Puerto Rico because of Hurricane Maria. Do you think that that should happen? It should happen because uh, what, what this hurricane has done is has been a catalyst in terms of the relation between the US and Puerto Rico, which means that Puerto Ricans realize, as our guests have rightly said, they consider themselves second class citizens. And the hurricane has highlighted that tragic status, that tragic relationship. Although the majority of Puerto Ricans want statehood, whether you agree with that or not, that's a different matter. As you said in your poll, the majority of Americans don't even know that Puerto Rico is somewhere around there. They probably think that it's a Latin American country somewhere there. So this limbo, which might sound too legalistic when you're dealing with human lives, is not because if there were, if there were a state, at least the government will have to take responsibility for what happens there instead of doing what they did today, which was neglected. In fact, in the State of the Union speech, President Trump didn't mention Puerto Rico as a, as a whole once, just mentioned it among other states that had suffered natural disasters. And many Democrats said, look, this shows how much the, the government doesn't care about that. And there's an element which I would like to add, and I think Carmen might, I hope she agrees with me. The, uh, scientists believe that the intensity of hurricanes had increased since the 1980s will increase more as a result of climate change. Since right. the government of President Trump does not recognize climate change as a problem, it's a very energy. unlikely that they will take measures. Well, let, let's ask Carmen, because this um, it, it has been uh, said by environmental scientists that the, um, that the frequency and impact of hurricanes will uh, get stronger because of climate change. Uh, it, I mean, I guess we don't... And we have, have seen sure, it. But we have seen it happening, haven't right, we? Right, we have seen it happen. OK. We've seen it happening more intense, larger, m much more intense. It's not necessarily the number of storms, it's the intensity. Basically. And, and, also and it, how fast problem, things because... some, in some occasions, absolutely. It is a, if you recognise climate change, you have to do something about it. You have to do something about not only the climate change, but also the consequences. After Hurricane Katrina, a lot of people said, we have to learn lessons, we have to do better, FEMA has to do better. Have there been changes? Have lessons been learned? Not very many, actually. This, all these disasters, the fact Florida, I mean, all these different hurricanes that this last season um, hit the United States, some parts of the Caribbean, and the, the poor response to most of them, it was in part, of course it is, a large magnitude event. It is a huge hurricane. It's almost unthoughtable what uh, the people in the Caribbean went through. But on the other hand, um, it is a large magnitude event that but we need to plan for. We need to have uh, some resources, give people, uh, empower people, give people the resources to be able to react themselves, the societies, yeah. not only the governments, everybody should be prepared. So if something fails in the government, the community knows how to react. They have a shelter, they know they have some resources on this shelter, and therefore they come out, they cut whatever, they, they clear their roads, and they have some water, and they have some first aid ready. 
Arellis, what is the narrative in Washington? Because, um, as I said, President Trump has been meeting with FEMA. The hurricane season uh, is now underway again this year. It started a, a few days ago. So is the narrative that FEMA is doing a good job and there is no need for change? Or have lessons been learned from Hurricane Maria? I think if you ask officials, particularly on the island, FEMA officials, they'll tell you, yes, we, we've learned some lessons. We learned that we needed to have storage facilities on the island for some of these materials, that we needed to have more personnel in place ahead of time uh, than, than what happened in Puerto Rico. Uh, but if you ask you know, folks in Washington, it, it's, you know, that we did the best that we could under the circumstances of an unprecedented storm. I, I can't tell you how many times I heard unprecedented um, in the reporting of this story. Yeah. Uh, and, and and that's the line that you know nobody could have been prepared for something as massive as as Maria. Do you, do you think that a better job could have been done? And it, it could have been done. Many Puerto Ricans are trying to solve the situation by themselves because they cannot rely on the government. Puerto Rico depends on 85 percent of the food they they consume from uh, from outside Puerto Rico, and the few crops in Puerto Rico were wiped out by Maria. They want to create some kind of self-sufficiency in terms of food so they can face the aftermath of a hurricane. The, the, all the climate change accords include measures to prevent, uh, you know, this kind of phenomenon happening because of climate change and also adaptation, which is part of the Valley Road, uh, one of the old uh, agreements about climate change. If, if the U.S. recognized that, they would have to take measures to prepare places like Puerto Rico for these kind of eventualities because they are reluctant to accept the climate change issue. They won't implement these measures. And these are crucial to make sure that these strategies, they will hit and it will affect many people, but it would have been much less tragic than it was if there was some preparation for this kind of situation. Erica, in Puerto Rico, uh, are people prepared for this year's hurricane season? <laughs> Um, I think there's a lot of fear. That's what I would say. <laughs> and I include my in that. Um, I, I don't think I can say that people are prepared when there are thousands of homes that have two cars as roofs. There's still 11,000 people without power. There's still mudslides and cover roads. So are we prepared? I think we'll try to prepare as we can, but we're not prepared 100% it is. Carmen, this is an issue, isn't it? People in Puerto Rico are still recovering from the effects of Hurricane Maria and now they potentially face uh, another hurricane. I think all the Caribbean are still in the reconstruction phase and it is a really dangerous time and I, I'm, I'm really worried of with this uh, uh, new hurricane season that is starting. Some scientists are saying that it might be uh, as intense as the previous one. Um, and it, it really? Does, so this year could be There has been rumours that, that it could last be. year was, was a pretty bad year. Uh, yes, it was very bad. And they're saying that this year could be as bad. Um, and, and of course, it is a, a huge concern for everybody because of they're not fully recovered. Many people are still living under tarpaulins in um, um, tarpaulins in, in Dominica, for example, and some people are still in temporary accommodation. I think we were seeing the same in Puerto Rico. These are not appropriate ways of facing the uh, next facing hurricane. The next season. hurricane if, you're, if you're in a Absolutely. temporary shelter. Is it not possible to develop some kind of brilliant early warning system that gives people a much longer lead time? But if people don't know what to do, you can have months, years. Right. If you don't know what to do, Absolutely. what are you going to do? Exactly. If you don't Even have the you resources. Know what's coming, exactly, the resources. every year. It's unlike a, 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 an earthquake that you know when it's coming. Hurricanes come every year. And it's obvious that the intensity of these hurricanes have increased since the 1980s. It is there. It's not speculation or political opinion. It's there. And unless measures are taken, then we are going to see more tragedies like the one we've seen in Puerto Rico. And more neglect if the government in the U.S. doesn't really realize that something has to be done about that. At the end of the day, it's going to cost the money, a lot of money to the government in the U.S. anyway, so they could save some money if that is the issue, exactly. you know, by preparing Puerto Rico for these kind of eventualities. I realize, I, uh, sorry, go on, Erica. I, I did want to say that it's not that people don't know what they have to do with face hurricanes for our entire lives, but I think it's a thing of resources and people having money to actually prepare too. 
uh, Arela, Arela, is uh, the feeling in, a, in the US that they are willing to do more given the huge number of deaths that have now been uh, estimated by, for example, the Harvard study? I mean, I'm not sure we've heard that yet from the federal government. I know that, you know, from rank and file FEMA officials, you know, the, the commitment is there. At least, you know, that's what they say and, and that's what they say they're willing to do. Um, I, there's Eric is absolutely right. I, you know, my entire Senate family is in Puerto Rico and they've been through this before. They know and expect that there'll be hurricanes, but they've never seen one like Maria. And but I think it's important to keep in mind the context of Puerto Rico, the fact that its political status and its billion dollar debt has everything to do with why yes. Puerto Rico has not been able to recover sure. from this. Yeah. It's 11 years of uh, economic recession in Puerto Rico and where people have been leaving for months and months and months and months. Yeah, and, and, and very few coming back to Puerto Rico. Uh, we wait to see what this year's hurricane uh, season is like and, uh, and what the response is and hope that it, it's not going to be so uh, politically influenced. And in this case, uh, in cross our fingers only. That's what you can do with this government. No, uh, and a lot to talk about, and I know we could go on for a lot longer, but we have come to the end of this. But thank you so much for all your, uh, your observations and your points. Uh, and thank you for watching. That's it for this edition of Roundtable. See you next time.